Welcome, and we'll call the Tuesday, January 16th, 2018 meeting of the Everett Planning Commission to order, beginning with the roll call, please. Chair Holland? Here. Commissioner Tisdall? Here. Commissioner Zielinski? Here. Commissioner Lavra? Here. Commissioner Yanisak? Here. Commissioner McGinn? Here. Commissioner Dunn? Here. Uh, I guess the first item on the agenda today is approval of the minutes from December 5th, 2017. Have the commissioners had an opportunity to review and any comments or corrections or motions? I would move approval of the minutes. Second. Any discussion? Call for the vote. Commissioner Dunn? Abstain. Commissioner McGinn? Abstain. Commissioner Yanisak? Vote to approve. Commissioner Lavra? Uh -huh. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisdall? Yes. Chair Holland? Yes. Uh, any reports from the, this is a uh, part of the agenda where if there's any uh, reports of the commissioners um, they'd like to share with the rest of us? Commissioner Dunn? No report. No. Commissioner McGinn? No report. Commissioner Yanisak? No. Commissioner Lavra? No report. Commissioner Zielinski? No report. Commissioner Tisdale? You know, I'm just excited that today we learned uh, where Alaska Airlines is going to fly and all that good work out at 29 years of working that issue. You know, it's, you just, there's a process and you just have to work your way through it. And I'm excited about that and what it's going to bring to a lot of the metro planning and stuff that we're doing. Agreed. Easier to get to Phoenix to see my dad. So. Uh, any uh, comments from staff? Uh, yes, Alan Giffen, planning director. A couple of things. Uh, the Opiate code amendment that uh, you uh, made a recommendation to the council on uh, at your December 5th meeting. Uh, we haven't scheduled it yet with the city council. With the new administration, we're briefing uh, the folks in uh, the new uh, administration, and uh, we should get something scheduled before the council fairly soon, but um, that'll be coming. Uh, the second item is for our February 6th meeting. We will have a meeting. And it should be primarily to talk about the uh, metro plan and uh, perhaps uh, even uh, some of the proposed regulations. But uh, that'll be uh, really the entire agenda. It, it would appear for the February 6th meeting. So uh, that's it from staff. Great, thank you. Well, this is uh, an opportunity for anybody in the audience to. Okay, sorry. Well, I was going to ask. Um, we were going to get an update on the riverfront at the end of last year, and that got pushed off the agenda. Did that happen, and did I miss it, or is that going to get rescheduled? I will uh, discuss that when we get to the work program on the uh, item three of the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is an opportunity for anyone in the audience who would like to address the planning commission on anything that's not on the agenda tonight. If so, please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Victor Harris, 3017 Lombard in beautiful downtown Everett, Washington. Uh, my primary reason for coming up tonight is to remind everybody that our meetings are captioned as they are broadcast. It is very important for ADA accessibility that everybody have their mics on when they are speaking and that you speak up into the mic, please. Uh, I also use assistive listening devices in here, so uh, that cuts me out of any conversational tone and does improve the uh, audibility of your voices and such. So if uh, you should be aware that the captioners are off-site, I'm not sure what city they are in, but um, they are remote, so they don't have the opportunity to tap you on the shoulder and say, we didn't hear what you just said. So if you would attend to that, please, uh, through your terms, I would certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the reminder, Mr. Harris. Anybody else would like to address the Planning Commission? Seeing none, I guess item one is the election of officers. Um, so we need an election for a chairperson and a vice chairperson, and that would be for uh, 2018. Any thoughts? I think you're doing a tremendous job. Thank you, Commissioner Tisdale. <laughs> Assuming that you're willing and 
interested in running again, I would nominate Chris to uh, repeat as our chair. I am in reviewing my calendar this year. Looks like I'll be around most of the year, at least on meeting dates. So <laughs> only one date I saw that I wouldn't be available, so I'd happily do so. In a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, call for the vote. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner McGinn? Yes. Commissioner Yanisak? Yes. Commissioner Labra? <coughs> Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Fisdall? Yes. Chair Holland? Yes, thank you. And Commissioner Tisdale, are you interested in vice chairing our meetings again for 2018? I could, but if there's someone else that would like to there's do that. Is there anybody else that has interest in? I'd actually, I would uh, move to nominate uh, Catherine Beck who wasn't able to attend tonight, but she did uh, confirm by text that she would accept the nomination. Okay. Is there a second? Or? I'll second that. Any discussion? Okay, call for the vote. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner McGinn? Abstain. Commissioner Yanisek? Yes. Commissioner Lavra? Yes. Commissioner Zielinski? Yes. Commissioner Tisdall? Yes. Chair Holland? Yes. Okay, it looks like we're over to staff for electric fences. Yeah, good evening. I'm Steve Inglesby with the Planning Department. And you should have a packet dated um, uh, January 8th, 2018, uh, that discusses uh, the uh, amendment of uh, electric fences. Uh, back in uh, October, uh, the planning director requested an initiation initiate, to initiate uh, consideration of a zoning code amendment to the electric fence ordinance. Uh, also with that, uh, there's an application from the electric guard dog company uh, that installs electric fences. Uh, so uh, attached in this um, packet is some photos which I've also presented a PowerPoint that I'll, I'll go through with you. And also, um, are there cities that either prohibit electric fences or allows electric fences with uh, certain standards and restrictions? Let's see. So our current code, uh, the zoning code, there's two code sections in the Everett Municipal Code. Uh, the zoning code, Title 19, uh, just outright uh, prohibits electric fences, but only allows them in the A1 zone. Uh, in Title 16, the Building Construction uh, Everett Municipal Code, it, it uh, also uh, prohibits electric fences. However, it does allow electric fences in the A1 zone, and so it matches up with the uh, zoning code. There, are addition, there is additional language, though, uh, where it talks about uh, the, the energizing of the, the electric fence and warning signs, um, which the zoning code does not have. <clears throat> I uh, made a visit to the city of Marysville, and there's an uh, electric fence that has recently been installed at a uh, towing company. Uh, this is a picture of, a, of the perimeter from the street right-of-way. And as you can see, there's a, um, a green, green slatted uh, fence with barbed wire on top. And the electric fence is behind that fence. So here's a picture of the electric fence inside. And so the strands of electric wire are running parallel to the, the ground. Up on top, you'll notice uh, the warning signs. Here's a picture of a uh, of the fence uh, the along the the right of way on the left side here, and then you can see the fence. The, the again, it's perimeter fence along the side lot line. So it's uh, again chain link with uh, the slats and barbed wire on top. Can I ask a question? Yes. Interrupt. In that picture, you said that the, the it was running horizontal. It looks like from the ground all the way to the top, extending above the fence. What was the, I couldn't quite get a sense for what the distance was between the, the exterior fence and the electric wire. 
Uh, let's if, see. In, that, in this situation here. I'll, uh, I'll go to another photo that, uh, let's see, I need to get back on track here. Okay, so here's, I understand what you're asking. Here is the uh, oh, okay. electric fence on the left side and then the uh, perimeter fence on the right side. So there's very little gap between the electric fence and the Three perimeter inches fence. or something, I think. Didn't okay. you tell us? Pardon me? Yeah. Wasn't it about three inches? Oh, can I answer? Yeah, I was going to say, it's more than... Yeah, on the gate, it usually is much tighter on the gate. If you could come up to the... Okay. <laughs> ...and address that, thank you. And state your name and address for the record. My name well. is Michael Pate. I'm with the Electric Guard Dog, and I live in Columbia, South Carolina at 3131 Hayward Street. Nice symmetrical number. Uh, on, the, on the gates, it's a much tighter application on the gates, usually between three and four inches, because most of these gates we're on are a chain-driven gate or an electric motor gate, and they usually have a guide, which is basically a bollard of some sort or a, or a post to guide that gate in there, and you have to have it on there really tight. When the fence is installed behind a perimeter fence, it's usually around, the standard says 100 to 200 millimeters. Conversion, that's four to eight inches. We usually put it right around a foot, somewhere in there. If we can get it tighter, we will. Sometimes you can't get it any tighter. So that's usually where we put it. Okay, thank you. And here's an, a, uh, an emergency access point for the fire department so they can uh, take down the uh, electric, electric current, current and access the, the property if need be. So the, the, the purpose of the electric fence uh, is, of course, to reduce theft. And uh, based on my uh, talking with the owner up in Marysville, that has been a success in reducing uh, uh, break-ins. Um, so I also researched other cities. And um, about half the cities prohibit the electric fence and the other half permit it. Uh, the ones that um, prohibit electric fences are uh, Bothell, Federal Way, Monroe, Muckleteal, and Shoreline. Three of the cities, though, do allow exceptions for um, agriculture purposes. Uh, the six cities uh, that, or the five cities that do, or six actually, uh, Auburn, Bellevue, Sammamish, and Toppenish require perimeter barrier. Uh, some of the cities just require it for residential zones. Um, so that would be similar to the, the pictures I just showed you where you have the perimeter barrier. Uh, others just uh, regulate the electric current. And uh, the uh, city of Seattle actually only is, is the only one that restricts the location and has no other standards as far as I could find. So <clears throat> not all the cities allow them in residential areas and uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the five that or six that allow it. So um, I guess for discussion purposes today, tonight, uh, we can, uh, if you'd like, we can uh, look at what zones we would allow electric fences, and if uh, we want to allow more than the A1 zone, uh, would we allow it in just non-residential or residential, or uh, also if we do allow it in uh, non-residential, what kind of standards would we uh, apply? To, to the fence, and if we allow it in residential, like some of these cities do, uh, again, uh, what kind of standards would we want? I don't know if that... Yeah, we're just looking for some direction so that uh, for the next 
uh, excuse me, the next meeting that we talk about this, which would probably be the uh, second meeting in February, we can be prepared with a uh, recommendation and have a decision hearing if the commission is interested or uh, excuse me ready to make a decision at that time and so tonight's just really to talk about uh, what your preferences are uh, things that you might uh, want to see in an ordinance or any concerns and get more information again we have uh, Mr. Pate from Electric Guard Dog here who uh, installs these systems all over the country and the ones who initiated the process uh, with an application. Has there uh, been any feedback from fire police at this point or uh, uh, no there has not I have talked with the building official and uh, the only thing he'd like to see changed I mean if if uh, we're going to be changing the ordinance he'd like to also add that the warning signs um, be modified right now it just says uh, in our ordinance uh, electric fences so under the last sentence here, it says an electric fence warning sign shall be posted at not more than 100 foot intervals. He'd like to see more description uh, on the warning sign if we're going to allow it in other zones. I have a question. What, what when cities are regulating this, what is the primary interest? Is it more aesthetic, safety, um, all of the above? What, what, what for the for the perimeter fence? Yeah. It's uh, oh, oh, mainly I'm talking for about just, just for regulating electric fences oh. in general. I mean, why does a city, why would a city say no, no or yes one way or another? Uh, generally, I'd say safety uh, issues um, that uh, although uh, supposedly uh, energized at that level wouldn't cause a uh, uh, danger, uh, it's still going to provide quite a shock, and, and uh, it's to prohibit that sort of uh, da danger or hazard to, to the public. And I would add that it's also in part aesthetics. So, if you, for example, if you had a, an electric fence in a residential zone, can you imagine all of these yellow signs and the wire fences along a residential street? It doesn't create a very friendly neighborhood image, and so uh, that's one reason also is for aesthetic purposes as well as safety. I noticed in the packet that was distributed that the height is listed as 10 feet. Is that ever vary? Do they get taller, shorter? And does that affect the perimeter fencing at all? Uh, so we, uh, I think the current code uh, prohibits fences over 10 feet. And so that would be a, a maximum by our current code. I think the 10 feet was proposed by the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's something that would be necessary, uh, whether, you know, if someone wanted to provide a seven foot tall <clears throat> electric fence, I, I think that would um, be okay with us. Um, I don't think it needs to go higher uh, unless there's uh, some reason the applicant can provide us with. Yeah, I think that the uh, state patrol requires a minimum of an eight-foot fence in order to even be on their list to, I mean, if we're talking uh, holding yards and things like oh, that. Mm -hmm. And I get, my assumption is, and I'm sure uh, the gentleman can answer that, is that, you know, electric fence needs to be a little bit taller than what the your perimeter fence is in order to be effective, I would assume. So mm -hmm. but maybe you could address that for us. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can take care of all these for you. Again, Michael Pate, sunny South Carolina, allegedly. Um, <laughs> let's go straight to height for you, because that's the last question that was answered. The international standard that we operate under that's been approved by LNI, by the way, because we, we basically up, operate under the standards LNI has put forth to us, dictate a 10-foot height. And there's a very simple reason for that, as the, chairman, uh, as the chairman recognized. If you have two fences that are the same height, Someone can just stand on the perimeter fence and drop in. Let's say it's eight or six or two. They're just gonna drop in, do their business, and when they break out, my alarm will go off. Then it's too late because you kind of lose the deterrent factor of the fence itself. So um, 10 feet is you know, about a standard height that's always issued in the IEC standard. Now there are other places that actually let me go higher, but that's because they have higher fence uh, allowances within their cities and I'm going to throw Ontario California out there because they're like the biggest distribution center on the west coast all kinds of warehouses and they mandate 10 foot concrete block walls between all these things so I've got to be taller than that 
and a lot of them are 12, so I get to go to 14 and 16 feet in that city and San Bernardino. That's really tall, and there's usually no really need for that at all. Um, let me address why yes and no. Most people who have, who have forbid the use of electric fences don't understand my technology and pulse electrical fences that operate on 12 volt batteries. What they're thinking about is an infrastructure. We've got a DC, I mean AC current, and someone has basically lined up a couple of a, a couple of cords onto a perimeter fence, and they've created a live death trap. Now, no amount of regulation is going to stop from someone from being that stupid, but it does happen. We are a pulsed electrical device. So I've got a 12 volt battery that has a capacitor and that capacitor takes that 12 volts and amplifies it to 7,000 volts or thereabout. And once it gets that capacitor loaded, it's mechanically cannot do anything else and has to release that energy down the line to do a quick peri perimeter check. So that pulse, that three ten thousandths of a second is so short in duration that it cannot harm anybody. Now we're actually tested to this standard by a nationally recognized testing laboratory. Someone also asked this question. Nationally recognized testing laboratory, there are 14 of them that, are, that OSHA certifies. UL is the most famous. Everyone knows who UL is. So our manufacturing facility is authorized to manufacture and, and test these devices to the IEC standard. We are audited once a year by the nationally recognized testing laboratory as to the, our capacity and whether we can do this or not. So right now we are, and we have been now for year two. It's taken us a long time to get to that spot because it, it's, very, it's, a very stringent, uh, it's a very stringent protocol that you have to be involved in for something like that. Can I ask, is the electric fence device that you're using, is that something that you guys manufacture It's unique to you, or is this a, an off-the-shelf um, device that and, and the answer to that everybody's is, using. is yes, the ones we have are, are specific to us. We actually manufacture the devices ourselves. Uh, now you can get off the, off, the, uh, off, off the shelf devices. If you go to your, your local farm supply store, you can go in there and get a Gallagher Energizer. And folks all over the country, including right here, use those for livestock containment. And you can hardwire those and not even use batteries on them. They're actually allowed to hardwire because they have a device in there that will actually take that, that AC energy and change it to DC energy and pulse it. We don't do that, but the, you can do those everywhere. You actually allow those devices in your town right now in A1 zones with no perimeter fences. So people walk by and hit those things all the time and they're pulsing between 14 and 25,000 volts and people are bumping into them all the time. So in an urban area you have other safeguards in there to keep the innocent passing passerby from bumping them. <clears throat> you got perimeter fence up. You have to have a perimeter fence minimum of six feet tall. You have to have warning signs, and the warning signs by the standard are every 10 meters. That's every 30 feet. So you folks have in this in this uh, draft here 100 feet. We put them up every 30 feet. They are an international symbol for shock in a minimum of two languages, English and Spanish. Um, we just had to put them up, Keith, in Russian, didn't we? In West Sacramento? Yeah. So I've got them in West Sacramento, I have to have Russian. In Houston, I have to have Vietnamese. It's just whatever the local population dictate, dictates to me for the language there. I've got 36 languages I actually print on these signs. So they're always up. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was going to say, what are the dimensions of your sign? Those, they look like... Yeah, about they're size. about the size of, of a notebook page. They're about this size right here. They have to be a minimum, I think, of 30 square inches is what the standard says. They're probably a little bit larger than that. They're bright yellow. They have to be exposed. That's why when you saw these up here on the photographs of this, of this uh, tow yard we have right up the street, they're up above so everyone can see them. If I had them down low behind that slatted fence, you wouldn't be able to see a thing. <laughs> So the warning signs would basically not, would be of no use at all. Um, I think we answered the gate application too and why it's so tight on the gate. And the reason we're here is we actually had uh, two businesses here in town actually ask us to permit the fences and when we came in, we weren't allowed to. So that's why we came to the city staff 
and spoke with them and we spoke to uh, the mayor and uh, that's why we're here. These, these couple of businesses actually wanted the, uh, the fences up and we actually came in here to get approval to do that for them. I guess I'd just say I, I'm familiar with like uh, uh, for livestock fences. I yes. Know, uh, we had, when I grew up, we had, we had 10 acres and we had an electric fence. Right. We, had, we had one of those systems, you plug it in the wall and it sends a little pulse. Right. I touched that many times. Yes. It doesn't hurt. I mean, it shocks you, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't hurt you. So I, I wouldn't have any safety concerns with regard to something like that. But I guess I'm unfamiliar if there's something more than that, or it wouldn't well, wouldn't be more than that. No, it's not more than that. It's actually less than that. We we those energizers can hold anywhere from 10 to 40 joules of energy. The standard for electric security fences only allows five joules of energy. So we're, we hold much less energy than a livestock fence. And I understand that's what you guys do. What about, are there other people in the industry or is there some standard that? There are other people in the industry, but most, most people in the industry use livestock energizers. And they operate under UL69, which is the standard for livestock energizers. Specifically, they're not allowed to be used for security purposes. So does this IEC standard um, specify the energy level? Yes, ma'am. I was going to suggest that I like this option five that says we're going to use the standard because it's the standard, <laughs> you know, written and, by and, people who know what they're doing. And, and Commissioner Lover, we actually have that codified in the state law in California. So in 2015 in California, we actually passed a state law that codified IEC standard into state law in California. We just did it this year in the state of Florida, codified IEC in the state of, of Florida also. So we've already got two states, one on each coast, who've actually codified it in state law. And we've got a couple of others working right now. The state of Texas only meets every other year, so I can't do Texas yet. <laughs> they have a very lazy legislature. <laughs> and Alan, has the city adopted the International uh, Energy Code or Electrical Code, I guess it would be? Is that? Uh, the, I don't know if it's international or national, <clears throat> but yet yeah, the city does adopt uh, whatever the, the state codes uh, require. And so uh, if that's, I don't know if it's IEC, I'm afraid I'm not an expert on yeah. the city's building codes. Well, yeah, most of them switch to, the, to an IBC, IEC, uh, and international resident R IRC. So I was just curious if that's what uh, Everett has. So. I think California's already gone to the, the international building codes. I think you actually have to have sprinklers in residential buildings now right. in California. And a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, states opt out of that because of the expense, but a lot of them actually have, are really going that way now. So I'm not, I'm not an expert on the building codes, but I'm a pretty much an expert on this little teeny little section of the International Electric Commission standards. <laughs> Alan, maybe this question for you. If we were to amend the code and allow this, something like this to, to take effect, would there be a separate permitting um, provision or is that something we'd have to put in so that someone, when they install the system, someone from the city would go out and actually look and make sure that it did in fact meet these standards? Well, again, not, not being an expert on the building code, I believe that our uh, building department would uh, require a permit for something like this, and I don't know what your experience is, Mr. Pate. And, and that be separate but. from anything we do it in our process. <laughs> well, what uh, our building official has asked is if we do amend the code, uh, that we also amend uh, the section that Steve showed you earlier, so that it had a little bit more uh, definition to it. But I think he's got separate standards that would apply uh, no matter what we do, and so uh, uh, I'll just. Uh, if Maybe Mr. Pate can uh, talk about his experience with other jurisdictions. Usually, I basically get a building permit, and that's because of the height of the fence. So I have to have an engineered plan for the wind loads because of the height. Um, in, some, in some states, my state, I have to have engineered plans for earthquakes and hurricane winds in Charleston, South Carolina. Hurricane force winds in Florida, and in some of the particular uh, cities in some of the uh, the canyon country in California, uh, I've got an engineer to 80 and 90 mile an hour winds, as well as earthquakes. So usually I have to get a building permit, but that's usually just because of the height, not these extenuating circumstances like high wind and or earthquakes. It's usually because of the height at 10 feet. Almost every place I go, six feet and over is considered a structure. 
Um, and I think uh, as far as getting a building permit, I think it's over seven feet in height. Seven when feet you here? Do, uh, so usually right around there, that's, that's where you're looking at a, uh, a building permit. So usually I get a building permit, I get inspected for the, for the footings and things like that. Usually for the electrical, I usually don't get a permit for that because I'm operating off a 12-volt battery. <coughs> However, in this state, L&I is the preeminent electrical power, <laughs> and they're the toughest electrical guys in the country. And they, and they uh, make me have a tested and labeled box everywhere I go. So the l and inspector will come up and look at my electrical control panel, which I've got three boxes up there, one for the electrical control panel, the batteries and the alarm, and they'll look at that thing and make sure it's tested and labeled with the TUV label on it and UL for the boxes. And then when they check that box off, they'll walk away. And, and that's been my experience too. Anything over six feet requires a building permit, and obviously electrical typically requires an electrical permit, but not a specific land use review or anything like that. That would be something that the commission would have to recommend, you know, notifying neighbors or something like that. So, well, the city requires a permit, a small permit, just to put a fence up. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you have to. I, I mean, just to put a four foot fence in front of my house, I had to get a permit. Uh, no, it's only over seven feet in height. Um, unless you're going to be building a fence in the right of way, then you do need to get a uh, right of way use permit. Or, or the setback, Steve? What about the setbacks? <coughs> setbacks, um, no. You have to be outside the setback line, too, right? Uh, for a tall what? fence. For a tall fence? Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to meet setbacks. That's pretty standard, too. Well, personally, I think it's a great tool for business owners that are trying to protect their. You know, whether it's a holding yard or just a <clears throat> storage yard and, you know, a lot of the businesses down, you know, around the um, uh, transit center and all that have a lot of outdoor storage and equipment and things like that. And to see all the property loss and to hear about it um, is pretty amazing. And if there's something small that can be done to help protect their inventory and try to limit some of these property crimes, I think it's a good idea, but also protecting the citizens as well. So, um I kind of fall where. Go ahead. Uh, I just had a couple of thoughts. My my first thought is on the height question. If our I don't know exactly what our fence height limits are, but if if say they're six feet or seven feet, my inclination would be to allow this kind of a facility to go two feet higher, but no higher than that, two feet above what our fence standard is. If it's six feet, then allow this at eight. If it's seven, allow it at nine, that kind of thing. Other thought is that uh, I, I see this as a business type of facility, and I would limit it to the non-residential zones, but I would also limit it to properties that don't abut residential, either the zone or a use, even if the use is in a non-residential zone. And, and Commissioner Zelensky, the IEC standard forbids the use in residential properties. But even if the property itself is business, but it adjoins residential, I would limit that. The uh, just to, on a side note, so the photos that you saw there on that north side of that fence, it's in Marysville, right next door is actually a Compass Health facility, residential facility. It's oh, in yeah. a general commercial zone, um, and I haven't heard any complaints about that one at, at this particular time. And you know they, um, so and it's you know people that are occupying those structures 24 hours a day that. Or there and using the yard right next to it. There's just those line of trees that mm. separate it. So I actually make those residential zones safer because people usually use those for cover for break-ins. They're not coming in the front door. They're coming in some place they've got cover. Covers are hedges, houses, things, little outbuildings, that's cover. I mean, that's just what criminals do. So. Yeah, I'm thinking more of an us in the aesthetic aspect of it. Understood. Yeah. If you've got a house or you've got, even if you're in an apartment building, and you're butting up against a business and it's got this fence running along your property, I'm not sure that's the kind of <laughs> environment that's conducive to uh, residential living, so to speak. So I'm not aware that we have a big demand for these. Obviously, you've mentioned a couple of businesses that are interested in doing it. Yes, sir. That's why I'm here. I'm, um, I, I wouldn't have been here for any other reason except <laughs> I had two, two businesses ask me practically within 30 days of each other to come in here. But given that I'm not, I don't think there's a, crime, a huge demand for this. Maybe there will be. Maybe they'll see I your so. product and then <laughs> go crazy. Everybody will want one. But at the moment, I'd be going 
kind of cautious with it would be my and, inclination. And Commissioner Zelensky, I'm, I'm an expensive alternative. I mean, although I really do work. Dogs are cheaper? I ain't cheap. <laughs> well, the thing about guards is, well, we used to be a, a, a guard dog company. Liability is out of the roof. You don't want to be a guard dog company. <laughs> but, you know, guards are a big liability, too. You know, they take breaks, call the girlfriends, go to sleep, and they also let people in. So um, I'm not trying to disparage everyone as a guard, but that's, that happens a lot. So I don't sleep. Every 1.3 seconds, I do a quick perimeter check back to my alarm. Would the two-foot restriction that Michael was talking about, would that hamper? No, it just makes me do a little more work. That, that, that happens sometimes. Uh, just to give you an example, I've got some uh, front yards that have only have six-foot height allowances, and they let me get two feet on a front yard. 10 feet through the through the sides and the backs uh, as long as I got the extra two feet that makes it very difficult to jump over I mean as a young man I couldn't jump jump off something 10 foot without breaking something and you know, we're trying to force everybody to go down to the bottom and when they go down to the bottom they touch the fence they turn around and walk walk away if they're good enough to figure out what to do I'm going to set the alarm off because in the end what I am is an alarm if I don't get the, if I don't get a clean clean read back Every five pulses, I'm setting the alarms off, and I'm going through a call list. I'm going to call Mr. Zelensky at 2 o'clock in the morning. you got a break on the northern perimeter, 220 feet from the northeast corner. What would you like me to do? We also have cameras incorporated with these. So you can pull up the camera in the middle of the night and not have to go out there because that's exceedingly dangerous also. So you want to be able to stay at home and see these things. Big tree fell over the fence. Let's lock it up, guys, and go back to bed. Or I've got five guys in a flatbed truck robbing me blind. Please call the local police department. Verified alarm. The police love it. Access. We're, speaking of that, we're also talking about access. The Knox box for emergency access. All the firefighters and EMTs have a key. And when they pull up there, they hit that key switch in that box. It not only drops the power off the fence, the electric fence, it also opens the gate. So it serves two purposes. It'll open the gate to and then go in there and do their business, whether it's putting out a fire or saving a life. What's your experience with them cutting? I mean, it's probably the same everywhere, but here you put one up and tomorrow it's all cut. They just right from the bottom up. They don't do that to me because once they do that, they're going to hit my fence. <laughs> you see it happen. And or they would hit, they would cut the alarm and... Yeah, the alarm the goes off or they're going to get shocked. Okay. I can't tell you how, how many times, Mr. Tizzle, I've seen like burglary tools sitting on the ground where someone hit it and ran away. Um, and, and the security officer will show it to me. Michael, come over here and look at this. Guy came over here, tried to slit the fence, hit the electric fence, dropped his tools and ran away. Well, we, we, we make those sites fairly hard and we, we, we prevent crime. Thank you. And we save, we save the police money. Every time you have a break-in, the police have to go, usually in pairs. They do an investigation. They have to go back. They have to file that report and then do it again. <clears throat> so we were just in a place the other day. They, have, they, they suffer six break-ins a year on the average, over $2,000 a break-in. That's just for the break-ins. Then the police time. You stop all that, you're saving a lot of money for a lot of people. Any additional questions for... I have one quick Those question. Those changes in Michigan. Um, would it affect the design, or is it possible to have the signs at eye level and not up above? Is that possible on your current design? It just doesn't work that way, Ms. Dunn. If you do that, then they're just going to step over the top of it. You actually need those two or three extra strands. See, I'm, I'm actually separated about eight inches apart up in the top. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about an eight-foot fence to a ten-foot mm -hmm. fence, there are really only three strands of wire up there. The only reason you can see it is because of the sign. That's the only reason. If you're walking by, driving by, you're not going to see it. It's someone who's got to be right up on it to look at it like this, and they'll see it. Mm -hmm. So it's really an unobtrusive device. Now, if you're looking at a static photo like this, and you're really trying to see it, I mean, you can hardly see the fence. All the little wires right there going up, what you really see is the gate itself and the slats. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to see my fence. It's just tough, but the signs give me away, but I'm required to do that as a warning. Were you asking about the signs themselves? Yeah, the actual warning sign to have it well, down on, at eye yeah, level. Well, on this one, you had to on this one because of the slats. Yeah. If I had them down on eye level, they're on my fence on the inside, you wouldn't see them. I have to have the warning signs up. 
This cannot do it. Now, on a, on a normal fence, they're lower. Mm -hmm. When I say normal, it's behind chain link. Now, a lot of people don't like chain link, but normally I'm behind it. So you're behind chain link, I'm usually right at eye level. Okay. It's not that high because it's more transparent and they can see right through it. When we're talking aesthetics, like you indicated, you know, having that above there, but for the sign up there, someone passing by wouldn't be as would not see it. So no. the sign in some ways adds to the diminishment of whatever aesthetic value there would be. You'd like to say that, yes, but I'm required to have the sign up there as a warning. But, it, but uh, that's only on the gate, though. You said in other areas? No, it's it, on the every fence, so. 10 meters, so every 30 feet, by the standard, I've got to have a sign on there. It has to be on the wire itself, not just... Wire so, so someone can see it, yes. Now, in Stockton, South Carolina, they make me put up two... F South Carolina. Stockton, California, they made me put up two foot by three foot signs. They're a big problem, the wind. No. They're a big problem, the wind, so I had to move them onto the perimeter fence. But still, they're huge. It was an old highway guy who was the director. <laughs> <laughs> what <a> big signs. <laughs> you got to make them. So our purpose tonight is to give guidance to the planning commission and recommend whether we would entertain a, a hearing, right? And, and yeah, so they could draft up some codes, and I'm sure right, do some right. environmental so, lessons. It's exempt. I yeah. I guess. Yeah. So it sounds. I don't know. I think we should at least have a hearing. It seems reasonable to me. Okay. The, the, the concerns, I, I guess, as far as looking at stuff, is I'd really like to get feedback from both fire and police. I know, at least in, in my experience, police was, um, uh, ex, you know, very excited about having those in their city. But fire, there were some hurdles to, to uh, go over there. And so if there's additional language that needs to be placed in uh, any potential regulations, that would be good to know of what their thoughts are. And then... Uh, also, the aesthetic thing, I, I'm not familiar with what is required for um, whether it's a holding yard or a storage yard or a rental facility or whatever the, the fencing is, is do we have standards by zone for what a fence needs to look like or can it just be, you know, pretty much, um, you know, chain leg see-through or is there some kind of a screening that is required depending on what the use is? Uh, and I'm not familiar enough to know about that. So that in some of our zones, we require something more than a chain link fence with slats. Uh, in other locations, uh, other zones, uh, there is no screening requirement if it's industrial to industrial, for example. But if it's uh, uh, on a perimeter uh, or abutting residential, then we require not only a solid site obscuring uh, fence or wall, but also landscape screening uh, on the outside. So uh, there are different standards in different locations, but uh, if I, I would imagine if we were to uh, move forward with something like this, this would, the electric fence would be inside whatever the exterior fence is, and so um, the, uh, as far as, as the standard, you know, it wouldn't probably be visible uh, behind any type of screening fence if it's just a standard chain link fence without any uh, screening required, uh, then you might be able to see that. But that's uh, probably going to be when it's industrial to industrial abutting uh, one another. So, but in all instances, if uh, an electric fence were, were installed um, per whatever that you were saying, the uh, a fence would be, because so a fence is not required industrial to industrial, but if I was to put in an electric fence, I'm gonna have to have a fence that separates uh, the general public walking by and has to be a it. perimeter fence yeah. up. That's in the standard. There must be a perimeter fence up that it, it, that adheres to the rules of the city first before we can ever put up an electric fence. So that was those are my thoughts. So. I agree with Christine. I think the staff. There were a couple things that you were going to change and let's bring it back and. The motion. No, I don't think so. No, we don't need a motion. We're just um, looking for some general feedback tonight. There may be folks in the audience, too, that would like to uh, right. address this on Thank, Thank you, you so much. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the Planning Commission on this topic this evening? Seeing none, sorry. So continue with your thoughts. I guess any, is there, is there any, any other staff? 
I think I think we've got a, a sense. Uh, I think between Steve and myself, uh, we've got a sense of uh, the discussion tonight, and uh, we can uh, take a, a look at a few other codes, uh, maybe out of the state. But uh, uh, the the main thing is to uh, I, I think incorporate the standard uh, that uh, is referenced here, and just. If you meet that standard and then we apply our own aesthetic standards uh, that would apply with or without an electric fence, then uh, we're going to be okay as far as um, both aesthetics and safety. And one last, I guess, question. As far as zones and things like that, you would expect them, these things to be installed more down in the, not in the downtown commercial zone or anything like that. Are we looking at different zones for allowances here or other zones that would need uh, administrative deviation to allow such a facility. Yeah, I think what we would do is probably make them permitted as in industrial zones and uh, uh, in certain standards in commercial zones. We wouldn't, for example, if we were putting it on Evergreen Way, we wouldn't want an electric fence out to the out to the front property line uh, along car dealership. You know, that, that's you know not not the look that we're looking for in uh, our arterial streets. But if there's you know, a storage area behind the showroom, behind the building, and you've got the electric fence that secures all of that perimeter, then that would be uh, something that I, I think we would recommend, uh, in court, excuse me, allowing within the code. Uh, if you had uh, something that came up against a residential zone or a residential use, as Commissioner Zielinski mentioned, we could either make it prohibited or some administrative review where there's notice provided to the uh, budding property owner and they'd have the opportunity to object or uh, uh, say that they were okay with it. So we'll, we'll prepare some options like that. Any other thoughts or questions? Well, I'd also look at the um, language that Seattle has that you included on abutting up to a, a public place in a manner that's hazardous to a pedestrian in a public place. So right. it sounds like there's some um, concern around residential and then also if we're thinking about public safety. Right. I'm yeah, just thinking of the laundry pod challenge and, you know, we can't really legislate against people doing silly things, but. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't want it up against a public park, for example. Yeah, yeah that, that makes good sense. Okay, enough direction? Yeah, I think uh, Great. so. Steve, do you have any questions or <clears throat> clarifications? I think we're good, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we're going on to what's cooking for 2018. Yes, and I put on your uh, desk there um, a memo that I uh, uh, put together today, and I, I waited until today because I had, have had a little bit of contact with uh, our new administration. As you might imagine, they're uh, very busy uh, uh, just uh, setting uh, up shop, and uh, I think uh, most of these things are already ongoing, uh, but I uh, wanted to wait until, see if I had any more feedback from uh, folks on the 10th floor. And, uh, what I've got here is um, broken into a few categories. And so obviously on the first item, code amendments, uh, for example, what we just talked about uh, is, is one of the things that's already in the process. Uh, under uh, B, retail marijuana store regulations, when the city adopted uh, its last iteration of regulations, it uh, was looking at the potential to increase the number of stores that were permitted. We, in our first ordinance, uh, the state said the most that we could have was five when they uh, merged the uh, recreational and the medical marijuana uh, programs. Uh, they then, the state uh, liquor and cannabis board said that uh, jurisdictions could have double the amount that was originally allowed under the uh, retail marijuana stores. Our city council at that time decided that uh, they're probably not, uh, uh, they weren't comfortable increasing it above the five, but they said, let's review it again in a couple of years. And in fact, I think it was Commissioner Zielinski that made that recommendation from the planning commission to uh, wait until we've got a little bit of a track record with these to see if there's uh, a reason to not increase or a good reason to uh, allow an increase. And so. That has to be uh, finished up by uh, June 1st uh, when the current ordinance expires, so we'll be bringing that forward. Uh, the uh, 
Item C, Metro Everett zoning regulations. Uh, I'll hold off on that until I get down to category two there, the Metro subarea plan. Uh, we're also looking at uh, some improvements, uh, the streamlining of our uh, off-street parking requirements. Currently our code has them scattered throughout the entire code in many chapters of the code, and we're looking to put them all in one chapter and, and do some uh, research as to uh, possibly changing some of the standards uh, for off-street parking. Uh, and so we've got some work that's going on there. Sometime this year we expect we'll uh, workshop that uh, and, and maybe uh, uh, get to a point where we're ready to have you make uh, some recommendations to City Council. But that's, uh, uh, we don't have a timeline on that yet. Uh, and the last item under that category, uh, as uh, with the last item, this one came to our attention. Uh, they made an application as is uh, allowed under our code and somebody else may, uh, you know, we might have a few others. We usually have two or three a year that are initiated that way and there's an application and a fee and a process that's established. For the metro sub area plan, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will have the uh, a workshop uh, at our next commission meeting to talk about the, the plan and uh, the policies uh, that would be constitute an amendment to our comprehensive plan. And uh, along with that, uh, we our intent is to have zoning regulations that would be adopted concurrently with the metro sub-area plan and also rezoning of the entire area within the, the metro boundaries. And so that's uh, pretty ambitious. We are um, working on the zoning regulations. We may have a, a sampling of uh, some of those uh, to share with you at the next meeting, probably not all of them. But uh, those three items are uh, the big heavy lift under the Metro sub area plan. We're hoping to have something by the middle of the year that would be uh, ready for action. Um, then uh, D under that category, there may be other programs that we uh, get to or, or start this year once we uh, go through the first three items. For example, a, a community renewal plan that uh, is under uh, state law, something that uh, would allow us to address blight and blighted properties within uh, the metro area that gives us some tools that uh, we don't have without the community renewal statute. And so those are, uh, that's one potential implementation item. There may be a number of others that are called for under the uh, metro plan, so uh, we, we could start some other uh, actions for you to uh, take a look at this year. Shoreline Master Program update, uh, we have to have that done by January, excuse me, uh, June 30th of 2019. We're just beginning the process. It's not a major update, it's a, uh, what they call a periodic update, just to bring uh, the master program into uh, line with any changes that have been made since our last major update. It's changes in state law, changes in things like, uh, oh, just comprehensive plan policies that might dictate that we uh, have some revisions uh, to our shoreline master program. Probably the big one will be critical area regulations, uh, wetlands and streams, and uh, we're still operating uh, within our shoreline master program with the 1990 uh, adopted shoreline, excuse me, critical area regulations. And so those have been mm -hmm. updated a number of times uh, outside of the shoreline area. So we're gonna be uh, bringing those into consistency, hopefully so we'll just have one set of critical area regulations and not two. Um, the Riverfront Master Plan, uh, as Commissioner Dunn had asked uh, earlier, we have uh, three properties there. The one on the north is Simpson Pad, and the one on the, excuse me, the one on the south is the Simpson Pad being developed. The one on the north is the uh, Eclipse Mill Pad. That's being developed uh, with townhouses. The one in the middle is the uh, Tire Fire Landfill site. And uh, we have had uh, some inquiries from uh, potential uh, developers there, but uh, it looks like the uh, the current property owner, which is the uh, successor to uh, Polygon, uh, Shelter Holdings, will be uh, coming back with some proposed changes to that plan. We've had some preliminary discussions, and so I expect that at some point we'll have uh, an application in the near future to uh, make changes that uh, would have to go back through planning commission and city council process for the master plan on that uh, that site. So um, that 
That would be it for the riverfront. Uh, for the Port of Everett Waterfront Place Master Plan, we are aware of two or three changes that uh, they will uh, be proposing that uh, are not uh, something that are, uh, can be approved administratively. They'd have to go back through the uh, Planning Commission and City Council, but I wouldn't characterize them as uh, significant changes to the uh, master plan. <coughs> Item six is our annual conference of plan docket cycle, which starts uh, with an application deadline of July 1st every year. And uh, we recently had uh, a workshop or a, a hearing on a couple of items, very, very minor docket this past year, but those are often affiliated with rezone uh, requests. And so oftentimes we'll get more than we had in this past year, uh, but uh, we never know until uh, after that application period. There are a number of other potential items that uh, could be coming forward. And item A, the amendments to the multifamily property tax exemption program. I know that one will be coming for you because the uh, program expires at the end of the year without uh, an extension. And uh, I think what we will do is take a look at some uh, changes that will be a little bit more specific regarding uh, housing affordability as part of that program. Uh, we're also uh, looking at taking our land use code, the original zoning code that we're working with uh, today was adopted in, at the end of 1989 and it's been amended about 200 times since that uh, period. We keep making it thicker and piling on and uh, we've added a lot of standards and a lot of standards that are kind of confusing between one zone and the other because we had different consultants and, you know, they have similar standards and but not quite the same and we're looking at just doing a basic streamlining and eliminating a number of zones kind of like what we're talking about in the metro plan where we're taking a dozen zones within the metro area and we're consolidating that down to three zones we have uh, a number of zones uh, that you, if you read through our code you wouldn't know the difference between a b2 and a c1 zone and what's uh, uses are permitted there but you know, they're just going back to a, a, an older code from 1956, and we've hung on to those uh, zones in the map, but they're virtually identical. That's just one example, but there's a whole lot of things that we want to begin streamlining there. It's going to be a major process. We're not going to get that anywhere near uh, the finish line uh, this year. I'd say probably it'll take at least a couple more years after this to uh, put all of those things together, but it's a uh, would be a huge improvement in our uh, regulatory system and make it a lot easier for people to understand codes, including staff who have trouble with it, <laughs> even though, you know, some of us wrote the codes and rewrote the codes a few times. Uh, the um, affordable housing, just in general, uh, this has been a big deal. Uh, as you're aware, uh, we also have had a lot of interest with, on the part of the city council, we had a, a city council retreat uh, a few months ago on a Saturday morning and spent a couple of hours talking about the metro plan and affordable housing and just really scratched the surface on affordable housing. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, at least having some discussions around affordable housing. Uh, you know, for example, in metro, we're going to have some uh, incentives for affordable housing, but uh, that's only in one area. You know, we may decide uh, uh, or be directed uh, to uh, bring some things forward to consider other uh, affordable housing measures. Um, the uh, college sub-area plan, uh, much like we're doing for the metro area, uh, gosh, after we adopted our new comprehensive plan update in 2015, we thought we'd be starting that this past year, in tw well, no, in 2016 actually, but uh, with uh, particularly Washington State University focusing on getting their building built and, and op opening. And with a little bit of a delay, uh, we thought we would also do a plan with uh, the housing authority that applied for some HUD funding to jointly with the city that we were unsuccessful, that we'd be in a planning process there already. And so um, uh, we may get something started there depending upon well, a number of different things, but that's uh, still on our plate for a, a possible uh, sub-area plan process. And the last one that I've got here, uh, we've been uh, contacted by Naval Station Everett. Uh, they're looking to uh, conduct a joint land use study that would be funded 
90 percent by the federal government, and uh, we would be managing that process. Uh, don't know much about it at this point. Uh, we'll be learning more as the uh, year goes on. We're going to have the uh, Federal Office of Economic Adjustment come uh, meet with us this spring and talk about uh, the timing and the requirements for a joint land use study. But the idea there is for uh, the uh, city and the naval base to talk about uh, and study issues of compatibility around interface between the surrounding community and operations on the military base. And, uh, you know, the interest is to uh, protect the military operations uh, on Naval Station Everett, yet also uh, look at the impacts of the Naval base on the surrounding community. And so uh, that's something that, uh, should it get funded, uh, could be starting later this year. But again, I don't know the details on the timing. And we've just recently been contacted by the Naval Station. They'll do a briefing, actually, tomorrow night at City Council meeting. Uh, the Navy will. And so uh, if you're inclined to attend or watch on TV, you'll learn a little bit more, and so will I. That's what I've got on my list uh, for this year. I think it's a fairly ambitious list. I'm not sure that we'll get to all of these things. I know we won't get through all of these things just because of the scope of a lot of the work that's mentioned on here. Some of these will carry on over uh, next year and uh, perhaps a couple of items even beyond that. Do you have any questions for me? We're not any deadline on the Metro plan. I mean, we're just going to keep plugging away at it, correct? That's correct. We don't have any deadlines. It's, you know, let's get it right rather than get it done quickly. Uh, it's not going to be quickly by the time we're done with it, but it'll be <laughs> very thorough. Perfect. I have a question. We should do. Um, I agree. It's a big list. I don't think we have even had one even close to this big last year. Um, and so I hate to add more work, but I was <coughs> reading um, about Marysville and the county looking at chronic nuisance properties. And I was wondering if maybe that would be good to add to the agenda at least later in the year after they've done some study. Um, so it addresses blight and community renewal, but it would be good to look at that at the entire city and not just the metro area. Okay. Yeah, I think that I, I read that too. I think that the you know county's going to have some difficulties on that. I mean, the, the way Marysville implemented theirs is that we control the water and the sewer, sim similar to Everett. So Everett could mm -hmm. do that. So what happens is, is if you're defunct and you know you have liens are now going on the property. This is mostly properties that people just will walk away from, and you know, as the police go there, they can't determine whether you have a lease, don't have a lease. There's nothing they can do about it other than arrest the people that are potentially have warrants. But once it gets into that state, we go through a process, and it takes about a month and a half or so to get there and yeah, remove everybody and board it up. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can get it reoccupied is for the bank to sell it, somebody new to come in, go out there, have it tested, make sure you have functioning water and all the bills have been paid and unlocked and all that. So that, that was the tool that Mary's will use, and it's been okay. really effective in the a lot of these homes and it's actually quite amazing just going and when they're removing these people they have a list on there of all the different homes that are vacant in the area and then they just go break into the next one oh, and just yeah. keep doing it over and over again so it's you know but it's it's been effective I, I don't know how many we've shut down but I think it's somewhere around seven now at least that were really bad nuisance properties with a lot of right. bad people a lot so. of complaints and yeah so if they reach a, a set level of the number of complaints or health complaints or well, the police will keep going back to these houses and there's nothing they can do. Right. And it all boils down to, and the billing will not accept a payment on a late bill for unless it's the property owner or, you know, something from the property owner saying these people have a legal lease or whatever else. So that was another thing that had to get on board with is to make sure that not anybody can go in, if you can, anybody can go in and pay a PUD bill, but Marysville wasn't going to accept payment from these, oh. you know, bad people. To continue to occupy a structure and turn the water back on, unless it was the actual property owner. So. Well, perhaps uh, at some point, I think uh, Steve Steve more regularly works with our code enforcement uh, liaison group between the multi department, uh, and, and maybe we can have a conversation with that group and have uh, a report back as to how uh, this program is working and ever with without. Uh, and maybe there is a need for some additional uh, language, but typically that, uh, or excuse me, a diff, a diff, additional legislation. I, I think that uh, if that were the case, uh, the code enforcement group probably would have brought that forward through 
legal department, uh, it doesn't normally go through the Planning Commission for enforcement type uh, <coughs> legislation, but uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, one meeting have a discussion just about code enforcement in general for the uh, uh, information of the commission and the public. Yeah, and Everett actually has adopted the property maintenance code with some exemptions or whatever else, which actually gives them stronger teeth to um, actually get some of these places cleaned up too, which is good. Well, we're not looking for an endorsement. This is just more of an informational item, uh, but uh, happy to answer any questions or talk about other things that might not have been on the list if you had questions about uh, other things. Anything else? I don't think so. Was there anything else for the good of the order then? Uh, that should be enough for tonight. Great. Thank you. I guess we're adjourned. Well, welcome, Carly. Thank you First very meeting. much. Happy to be here. Yeah.